Greetings true believers, Mary here, the Mary Marvelite, and welcome to another amazing episode of History of the Marvel Universe. This channel is sponsored in part by Patreon supporters. If you would like to vote in monthly polls to help decide which topics get added to the schedule, you can head over to patreon.com slash marymarvelite and sign up for as little as one dollar per month. For this week's video, we're not technically looking at the Marvel Universe, Reality 616, but rather an alternate timeline which branched off from it, creating a once potential future. Reality 691. This timeline shares much of its history with that of the prime Marvel Universe up until the 20th century. For example, the time-traveling Immortus encouraged the hostile alien race stationed on the planet Mars to turn their attention towards the Earth, as part of his ongoing campaign to prevent humanity from developing space travel on behalf of the enigmatic timekeepers. These so-called Martian masters launched an attack in 1901 which failed after three weeks due to the aliens being susceptible to Earth's diseases. These events were chronicled in the H.G. Wells novel, The War of the Worlds, but a disinformation campaign caused the attempted invasion to be dismissed as fiction. This is confirmed to have happened in the timeline of Earth-691, but it's likely that it also happened on Earth-616. The Martian Masters are known to have invaded Earth-616 in the year 1917, but they were repelled by a group of costumed heroes including Sir Steel, Union Jack, the Crimson Cavalier, Iron Fist, and the Phantom Eagle, collectively known as Freedom's Five. And so the timelines continued to run similarly, if not identically, throughout the first half of the 20th century, including World War II. However, things notably diverged in 1982 with the early dissolution of the Earth's ozone layer, due to the meteoric rise of the aerosol industry. Uh, this kicked off a skin cancer epidemic which forced people to wear protective clothing to stand even momentarily in direct sunlight. There were also rapid developments in the field of bionics to repair those who were already damaged, and so mechanical limbs and surgical modifications which allowed people to walk outside became more common. With the environment and the economy in decline, the American space program used the last of their funding on Project Star Jump in 1988. Uh, this mission sent a one-man craft called the Odysseus-1 to the neighboring Alpha Centauri star system, preserving its lone pilot in suspended animation for the thousand-year journey. The astronaut who volunteered for this was Major Vance Astro, who himself would become a key difference in the 616 and 691 timelines. On Earth-691, he was born in 1962 with a mutant X gene under the name Vance Astrovic. He grew up longing for adventure, idolizing the World War II hero Captain America, but his powers did not outwardly manifest during puberty like they typically do for most mutants. In spite of his abusive father's attempts to discourage him, Vance succeeded in becoming an astronaut and legally changed his last name to Astro. It should also be noted that the personal timeline of Vance Astro has shifted to become misaligned in different realities due to alterations in the time stream and the nature of Earth-616's sliding timescale. This has led to conflicting reports on whether Project Star Jump occurred in the 20th or the 21st century, but for the purposes of this video we'll focus on the original timeline of Earth-691 in which Vance Astro's mission began in 1988. Several years later, a rise in cybernetic implants and a dwindling food supply led to the bionics wars of the 1990s. This went on until a nuclear disaster devastated North America, leaving the western half of Canada uninhabitable. This in turn led to the Treaty of Peking, and in 1995 mankind was finally united under the first confederation of nations. People worked together to rebuild, and the world began to heal. However, while humanity was united, mutant kind was still ostracized and othered, hunted by the humans' sentinel robots. Many were killed by the monstrous machines before their assault was halted by Prince Namor, the Sub-Mariner. Meanwhile, most of Earth's mutant population was rallied together by Magneto, a mutant who had been labeled both an activist and a terrorist depending on who you ask. 
Magneto led most of his people in an exodus of Earth, traveling to the Jovian moon Europa and establishing their own mutant colony beneath the northern magnetic pole. There, they began the construction of three star cruisers intending to search the galaxy for a more suitable home. Some mutants refused to abandon their home planet, but they would soon face an even greater threat. In the year 2001, the Martian Masters returned and the War of the Worlds truly began. Captain America, the living legend of World War II, was slain and his indestructible shield was claimed by Doctor Doom. Some foresaw that a Martian victory was inevitable and reluctantly abandoned the Earth. Doctor Strange traveled to the planet Lem, where he eventually began tutoring the next Sorcerer Supreme, an alien named Kruger. While the Silver Surfer was seemingly convinced by the cosmic entity Eon that his destiny lay elsewhere. Eon's purpose in the cosmos was to nurture the evolution of sentient life and to appoint a champion as the protector of the universe, and so the Silver Surfer trusted her judgment. However, it wasn't really Eon who convinced the Silver Surfer to leave, but rather her son Era, who had defeated and replaced his mother, and conspired to see the Earth lose the War of the Worlds. Although Era's motivations were largely mysterious, his ultimate goals were to destabilize the natural order of the universe and eventually bring about a prophesized war between cosmic beings. On Earth, Tony Stark, surrendered to alcoholism and desperate to preserve his legacy, launched his technological records into deep space. Meanwhile, the mystic, Dr. Druid, conferred with three Celtic war goddesses who assured him that the Martian invasion was unstoppable. To preserve a record of what had happened, he took the medieval manuscript known as the Book of Kells to an Irish mutant who remained on Earth, the Calligrapher. With his omni-sight, the calligrapher added to the Book of Kells, inscribing the events of the War of the Worlds, even those which were yet to happen. The last thing he wrote was an account of his own death at the hands of the Martians, which came to pass soon after. To keep the book safe, Dr. Druid entrusted it to an Irish superhero named Shamrock, whose powers afforded her eternal life. To provide her aid and companionship, Druid summoned the demigod, Cuchulain, before disappearing from the mortal plane himself. Meanwhile, Magneto was fighting a battle of his own against the megalomaniacal Apocalypse who intended on enslaving his mutant people. In a final stand, the Master of Magnetism was able to destroy Apocalypse, but at the cost of his own life. With two of the planned three star cruisers completed, the remaining mutants recruited Wolverine to lead them in their journey to the stars. Back on Earth, while most heroes fought on the front lines in New York City, Wendell Vaughn, better known as Quasar, the aforementioned protector of the universe, battled Martian tripods in the Midwest with his cosmic weapons, the Quantum Bands. During the war, not only did Quasar lose his mother and sister, but he found out that his lover, Kismet, a genetically engineered superhuman similar to Adam Warlock, was pregnant. Desperate to protect their unborn child, Quasar took Kismet to the planet Vesper, where he left her under the care of the intergalactic Sisters of Mercy. The Mother Superior there insisted that he stay and rest, but Quasar was determined to return to the War of the Worlds and attempted to quantum leap back to Earth. Seemingly due to his fatigued and desperate state, Quasar materialized next to an all-consuming sentient galactic nexus point known as the Abrogate, which absorbed and killed him. However, this too was the work of Era, who redirected Quasar's quantum leap to prevent him from returning home. As the War of the Worlds neared its end, the Synthesoid, known as the Vision, also left the Earth, but with the intention of finding and retrieving the lost mutant colony. Before leaving the solar system to search for them, the Vision attempted to save his brother-in-arms, Wonder Man, teleporting him to the planet Neptune in a process that took 30 hours to complete. However, Wonder Man was in the midst of a critical battle in the war and demanded to be sent back. 
the Vision acquiesced, but by the time Wonder Man returned home, the battle was lost and most of Earth's mightiest heroes were dead. One of the most renowned heroes in this final battle was the amazing Spider-Man but he too was killed and his body was taken back to Mars as a trophy. One of the few surviving Avengers was the Thunder God Thor who returned to his home of Asgard. There he was comforted by his beloved Lady Sif and the two eventually conceived a son who they named Woden, after the old English name for Thor's father. In the end, the Earth was conquered, the population was decimated, humanity was enslaved, and almost every superhero on the planet was dead. Meanwhile, the mutant exiles made their journey through the stars, inadvertently trespassing into the territory of the Shi'ar Empire. Wolverine battled their greatest warrior, Gladiator, for six days straight, losing one of his claws in the fight. Gladiator claimed a victory for the Shi'ar, but allowed the mutants to proceed on their journey. On the planet Vesper, Kismet gave birth to her and Quasar's child, only for the newborn to be stolen by Era, still posing as Eon. Era secreted the child away to the planet Arcturus IV, a world with two suns and no night. This is a world where decades prior, fetuses were bred in laboratories to engineer desired traits. The people of Arcturus revolted against these practices, leading to a genetics war that ended in a nuclear disaster. The genetically engineered Arcturians quickly adapted to the radioactive conditions following these events, but many of them mutated into new inhuman forms. The more human-looking Arcturians became known as the Reavers and began a campaign to slaughter the mutants of Arcturus. It was near the end of this genocide that an Arcturian mutant couple discovered the infant child of Quasar and Kismet in an abandoned genetics lab in the Forbidden City. Later in life, the child would mistakenly believe these two to be his biological parents. However, the peaceful mutants were soon killed in the final death raid against their kind by a reaver named Ogord. Thinking the baby was one of his own kind, Ogord recovered the infant child. The reaver was impressed with how the child didn't cry or whimper, suspecting that he was strong. The strange truth behind the child's calm demeanor is that he was granted a special state of awareness caused by his own future self coming back in time to inhabit his own body and relive his own life countless times. Bringing him back to his wife Salon and his daughter Alita, Ogord named the boy Stakar and raised him as his own. Back on Earth, by the year 2016, a group of free men had risen up in revolt against the Martian occupation, led by a young man named Jonathan Raven, better known as Kill Raven. There's a lot more that could be said about the origin and exploits of Kill Raven and his free men, but we'll leave those stories for another time. Records of what happened on Earth over the following half century are spotty, but it is known that by 2075, the Martian masters had abandoned the planet. Meanwhile, on the planet Arcturus, Stakar Ogord experienced adolescence lacking a full awareness of his previous lives. Eventually, he and Alita reached adulthood, but it's difficult to say exactly when this happened given that Arcturian lifespans are known to last well over a thousand years, but since Stakar was not a natural-born Arcturian, it was likely sometime in the 21st century. Without consciously realizing that he had already done this countless times before, Stakar instinctively knew that his destiny lay in the Forbidden City. Searching underground, Stakar discovered an abandoned temple containing a giant statue of the ancient Hawk God. Alita followed him, seeking to protect him, and the two spent the following week exploring the ancient temple. During this time, Stakar reconstructed an ancient brainwave helmet he'd recovered. However, soon after, Alita spotted her father and his reavers closing in on them. Worried about what would happen if they were discovered, Alita panicked and threw down the brainwave helmet to get Stakar's attention. This caused the helmet to emit a beam that transformed Alita's body into pure energy. This energy then merged with the giant statue, bringing it to life. 
Imbued with the power of the Hawk God, Alita lost control and went on a rampage, battling the Reaver fleet in the skies of Arcturus. To stop this, Stakar used the helmet to join his mind with Alita's, resulting in a massive explosion which was interrupted by a subsequent implosion fusing the two together. The surrounding area was reduced to glass, and standing in the center was a new composite being known as Starhawk. The Reaver Ogord wished to use this new power in his conquest of new worlds, but now with the knowledge of his past lives unlocked, Starhawk refused and escaped into deep space, while Ogord swore revenge. Over the following centuries, Stakar and Alita wandered the stars together, sharing one body while befriending life forms and defending planets across the universe. Their combined Starhawk form would present itself as either male or female, depending on which of the two was in control. Meanwhile, back on Earth, most of the planet was left in a barbaric state. Science and technology were hoarded and concentrated into feudal cities, while the rulers of these cities, known as Techno-Barons, warred with one another for resources and control of the moon. They also performed research into genetic engineering and space travel. During this time, there was a scientist named Isaac Harkov who made incredible theoretical breakthroughs. Although his work was lost for centuries following his death, it would eventually prove instrumental in the development of faster-than-light travel. While the Techno-Barons ruled the Earth, the mutants discovered a planet capable of sustaining them, which they named Haven. Several generations had passed since they left, and so Logan was the only one remaining among them who had walked the Earth. While he disliked the notion of leading, his descendants ruled over the people of Haven, and as the generations rolled on, more of their population was born without mutant powers. Meanwhile, the Martian masters who remained on Mars were attacked by a genocidal alien known as Bubonicus, who wiped them out with a deadly virus. The sole survivor was a Martian named Ripjack, who mutated himself using radioactive blood from the preserved body of Spider-Man. While this allowed him to survive Bubonicus's plague, Ripjack underwent a painful transformation. Utilizing a lab droid, the last Martian created an armored battle suit to contain his new form, and Ripjack was reborn. He then set forth into the galaxy to begin searching for the source of the virus that killed his people and exact his revenge. Elsewhere, early Arcturian starships attempted to attack and steal an alien craft. This effort was thwarted by Starhawk, only fueling his enmity with the Arcturians. Back on Earth, the lower class of humanity rose up and rebelled against those who lorded over them and hoarded technology. The rule of the Techno-Barons ended in 2525 with the execution of the tyrant Qual. Communication between the city-states was established, and by the year 2553, humanity had founded a new World Federation. It was also in the 26th century that the Silver Surfer was granted the Quantum Bands and became the new Protector of the Universe. He subsequently encountered a warrior named Dargo Kator, who wielded the Hammer of Thor. When the Earth was threatened by the Surfer's former master, Galactus, the Surfer stood alongside Dargo and another former herald named Firelord to repel the World Eater. They channeled their cosmic powers simultaneously in one powerful blast. However, this attack was blocked by Galactus's then-current herald, Frankie Ray, better known as Nova. Nova perished in the attack, and Galactus nourished himself on her remaining cosmic energy. The World Eater then left the Earth, swearing never again to take another herald. Shortly thereafter, the Surfer learned that his own home planet of Zen-La was also imperiled, but arrived too late to save it. Enraged, the Surfer attacked Galactus again, blaming his former master for keeping him occupied while his home planet died. However, Galactus struck back, draining the Surfer of his cosmic power and destroying his board. Left adrift in space, Norin Rad, the former Silver Surfer, was recovered by Arryn, the rogue Watcher. 
Brought outside of the universe itself, the former surfer learned to fully utilize the quantum bands, summoning the cosmic power from within and becoming known as the Keeper. Meanwhile on Earth, genetic engineering was used to create subspecies of humans capable of living on other worlds in the solar system, such as the flame-haired Mercurians. The crystalline Pluvians could survive without air or heat on Pluto, while the large and powerful Jovians populated floating city spheres hanging in the atmosphere of Jupiter. The planet Venus remained uninhabitable, but humanity was able to build thermoelectric power plants on the surface that transmitted energy back to Earth via laser relays. Then in 2850, the writings of Isaac Harkov were unearthed. His theories were proven correct in 2900 after the Mercurians discovered a mineral capable of fueling the kind of engine necessary for faster-than-light travel, which was then named Harkovite. In 2908, Earth built its first Harkovian starship, the Andromeda. While this ship was lost on its maiden voyage, by the mid-2900s they had begun the construction of an entire fleet. By 2960, humanity had reached the Alpha Centauri star system and made contact with a friendly alien race, the Centaurians. This led to the founding of Earth's first interstellar colony on Centauri IV. Finally, at the turn of the millennium in the year 3000, all of Earth's colonies partnered together to form a united federation. At some unspecified point during all of this progress on Earth, the technology and information launched into space by Tony Stark landed on a world populated by savage but intelligent beings. This race studied the technology for several centuries and over the course of generations began to understand it. Worshipping Iron Man like a god, this race became known as the Stark, and their planet was heavily industrialized. Creating armor of their own, the Stark began pirating resources from other worlds as they terrorized the galaxy. Elsewhere in space, the spirits of Stakar and Alita grew lonely while unable to physically interact. Secretly returning to Arcturus, they pleaded with the Hawk God to separate them into two beings, which he agreed to do temporarily. They lived as man and wife for a time, during which they produced three children, Terra, Sita, and John. However, Stakar's foreknowledge of his own destiny would force he and Alita to again take the form of Starhawk. They built a simple but idyllic home on a lone asteroid which they could monitor and contact during their long absences, and continued to shape the destiny of the galaxy. Then, in the year 3006, Vance Astro completed his thousand-year journey, landing on Centauri IV. While he was greeted as a legendary hero, Astro was shocked to find that humanity had beaten him there by unlocking the secrets of Harkovian physics. Without purpose, and unable to even remove his containment suit without dying, Major Astro went through the motions of his original obsolete mission, cataloging the planet's life forms. While exploring, he came upon a native Centaurian named Yandu Udanta, who was in the midst of a ritual marking his passage into manhood. When Astro inadvertently interrupted his ritual, Yandu mistook him for a threat and attacked. It was then that Vance Astro's latent mutant powers finally manifested and he knocked Yandu back with a psychokinetic blast. Fortunately, Astro was then able to de-escalate the situation and the two reached an understanding, even becoming friends. However, over the course of the following year, Federation worlds were invaded and attacked by the Brotherhood of the Badoon. The Badoon are a peculiar alien species in that the males and females despise each other so vehemently that they are segregated with the females confined to their homeworld, Latiara, while the males roam the galaxy. Once a year, the males would return to procreate, taking the fertilized eggs with them to increase their number. Any offspring which are born female would subsequently be returned to the sisterhood. While the Badoon females are typically peaceful, they are generally stronger than the violent and aggressive males. 
by the end of the year 3007, Earth, Centauri IV, Mercury, Jupiter, and Pluto were all conquered by the male Badoon. Large percentages of the populations were annihilated while most of the survivors were enslaved. Roughly one or two months after the Badoon invasion, a Jovian named Captain Charlie 27 returned to Jupiter having completed his half-year trip around the solar system. He soon discovered the Badoon occupation and that the few remaining Jovians were forced to mine Harkovite without sufficient protection, dooming them all. Such a fate awaited his own father, but Charlie was attacked by the Badoon and forced to flee. Unable to save his people, Charlie 27 escaped through an interplanetary teleporter, but didn't have time to set the coordinates. Arriving on Pluto, whose population had also been wiped out, the last Jovian met the last Pluvian, a man named Martinex. The two joined forces and fled from the Badoon, using the teleporters to travel to Earth. Meanwhile, Yandu Udanta and Vance Astro had been captured by the Badoon while fleeing Centauri IV and held prisoner on Earth. Astro pretended to betray his friend and align with the Badoon, seemingly so that he could execute him with his own bow and arrow. However, the arrow was made from a sound sensitive material called Yaka, allowing Yandu to control its flight path with his whistle. And so Major Vance Astro and Yandu Udanta ran from the Badoon together. As they fled, they encountered Charlie 27 and Martinex and the four joined forces. United in their desire to resist the Brotherhood of the Badoon, these four men, each born on a different world, aspired to fight back against their oppressors. However, what they didn't realize was that their coming together was not a coincidence and that they had been unknowingly aided and guided by Starhawk the entire time. For their first two weeks together, the soon-to-be Guardians spent most of their time laying low and avoiding capture, but they formulated a plan to obtain a spacecraft of their own and build a resistance. Sneaking past the Badoon guards, they used the interplanetary teleporter to travel to Jupiter where Charlie 27 could get them a ship. However, the Badoon were monitoring the teleportation systems and ambushed them when they arrived. Unable to reach a Jovian craft, the four instead stole a Badoon shuttle and attempted to escape. However, they were soon shot down and crashed on the Jovian moon Europa. While the ship was destroyed, the four slipped away undetected using an escape pod to dive into the subsurface ocean. Much to their surprise, they stumbled upon an abandoned underwater colony, not realizing it had been built by Magneto and the mutants 1,000 years prior. There, they found food and supplies that had been preserved for centuries, 20th century superhero costumes made from tough materials that they adapted to suit their own purposes, and most importantly, the unfinished star cruiser that the mutants had left behind when they departed the solar system. Over the next six months, the four completed this vessel, forging it into their new interstellar headquarters, the USS Captain America. Over the next several years, Vance Astro, Yandu Udanta, Martinex Tanaga, and Charlie 27 fought at the forefront of the resistance against the Badoon, becoming known as the Guardians of the Galaxy. Then, in the year 3014, a human woman named Terran found herself suddenly transported to unfamiliar surroundings. In truth, she had accidentally been pulled back in time to the heroic age of Earth-616, while the Fantastic Four were experimenting with Doctor Doom's time platform. It should be noted that due to the shifting nature of Earth-616's sliding timeline, exact dates are inconsistent during the Marvel Age of Heroes. However, in relation to Earth-691's timescale, the point she arrived at was roughly the equivalent of that timeline's 1974, several years before the climate crisis which caused the two timelines to significantly diverge. 
The legendary hero, Captain America, was visiting the Fantastic Four's headquarters at the time, and so Terran explained the Badoon occupation of Earth. As a result, Captain America, S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Sharon Carter, and The Thing accompanied the future woman back to the year 3014 to aid in the Resistance. Joining forces with the Guardians of the Galaxy, the 20th century heroes helped humanity free New York City from the Badoon, giving the Resistance a foothold on Earth. The past heroes then returned to their own time, and the Guardians learned that such a thing was possible. The following year, after searching through the Badoon's historical records in New York, the Guardians also learned that the Brotherhood had attempted to invade Earth over 1,000 years prior. In Earth 691's timescale, this occurred around the year 1968, but was thwarted by the Silver Surfer. Like the Martian invasion of 1901, this early Badoon attack was also caused by the machinations of Immortus. Unaware of these details, the Guardians traveled back in time to learn more, landing in 1975. They helped the Defenders, Doctor Strange, Hulk, Valkyrie, and Nighthawk, defeat a creature called Eelar, a common eel that had been mutated by discarded Badoon technology. After that, the Guardians learned from Doctor Strange that the Badoon invasion they described had never happened, not realizing this was because the Silver Surfer had prevented it. Complicating matters further, their starship was discovered by a 13-year-old Vance Astrovic. Taking a moment to connect with his younger self, the older Vance told him about the world he came from, leaving out key details such as his own identity. Doctor Strange then sent the boy back to his parents, but not before erasing his knowledge of future events. The Defenders then accompanied the Guardians back to the 31st century and aided them against the Badoon. During this adventure, Starhawk finally revealed himself to the Guardians intercepting Vance Astro's attempt to teleport to Earth and redirecting him to La Tiara, Starhawk met with Vance and led him to the city of Venetia, the home to the female Badoon. From Astro, the Badoon Queen Tolaria learned of the Brotherhood's brutal occupation of Earth and its colonies. The Defenders needed to return to their own time, but not before Doctor Strange forced a large contingent of Badoon to fall asleep during a key battle. Not long after that, the Guardians of the Galaxy led the charge in the final battle for the fate of the Earth. In the end, the Badoon Governor Kord was killed and victory was declared. Further retaliation from the Badoon was rendered unlikely thanks to an alliance with Queen Talaria and the Badoon Sisterhood, who had secretly developed their own space-worthy vessels. Uh, the surviving Badoon males were turned over to the custody of the Sisterhood, and the Earth was at peace once again. However, the Guardians soon found that peaceful life among normal humans didn't suit them. Martinex, Yandu, and Charlie were each seemingly the last of their kind, and so they experienced prejudice on Earth. Even Vance Astro, who'd been lauded as a legendary hero, felt trapped in his protective suit and without purpose. But then the four were brought together again by Starhawk, who convinced them to join him in search of new adventures. And so the five heroes ventured forth on board the USS Captain America, boldly going in search of those who needed the Guardians of the Galaxy. They soon met a nimble and flirtatious sharpshooter named Nikki who joined them on their voyages. The last surviving Mercurian, Nikki had also lost her home and family in the Badoon invasion. Although their own war with the Badoon was already over, the Guardians did finally uncover a more complete record of the Silver Surfer's encounter with them over 1,000 years prior. They also learned of Starhawk's dual personalities of Stakar and Alita, and the circumstances which fused them together. Meanwhile, Alita's father, Ogord, had survived the centuries to become the High Commander of the Arcturian Reavers. Still seeking revenge on Starhawk, the Reavers launched an assault on the Guardians of the Galaxy, destroying their ship, the Captain America. However, the Guardian survived by boarding and commandeering an Arcturian scout ship, the Kamar. The Reavers also found and attacked Starhawk's asteroid home, abducting his three children. 
Using Arcturian technology to mentally control the children, High Commander Ogord unlocked their latent powers. Transforming them into psychic vampires, he unleashed them on Starhawk. The children rapidly aged to adulthood as they were forced to drain their parents' energy, but the other Guardians then arrived on the scene. Vance Astro freed Terra, Sita, and John from Ogord's control, but the trio then turned their powers on themselves, aging themselves until they crumbled to dust. Starhawk was devastated by the loss, and Alita's grief slowly festered into hatred of Stakar. After that, the Guardians happened upon the Federation shipyard known as Dry Dock, which was thought to have been lost during the war with the Badoon. There, they constructed a new starship called the Freedom's Lady and set forth into the galaxy once again. Shortly thereafter, they discovered a frozen humanoid figure floating in the vacuum of space. Determining that this being was miraculously still alive, they brought him on board to discover that it was in fact the Thunder God Thor, who had traveled forward in time from the 20th century. This led to another adventure in which the Guardians and Thor joined forces to battle the cyborg supercriminal Michael Korvac. The Korvac saga is another topic that could be covered in more detail at a later date. For this week, the short version is that the Guardians of the Galaxy pursued him backwards through time from 3019 to 1978, where they joined forces with the Avengers to battle Korvac and protect a young Vance Astrovic. Before returning to their own century, they spent some time in the past befriending and teaming up with several heroes of that era. Starhawk even met a woman who was then known only as her, but would later take the name Kismet. Of course, in the timeline of Earth 691, she would become the biological mother of Stikar Ogord early in the 21st century. Vance Astro also visited the younger Vance Astrovic once again, this time triggering his teenage self's latent mutant powers. While the Guardians then returned to their own timeline, this event in which Vance Astro altered his own history is credited with ensuring that Earth-616 and Earth-691 diverged from one another. Furthermore, while Earth-691 appears to maintain a fixed time scale, albeit with divergences resulting from Starhawk's repeated lifetimes, Earth-616 operates on a sliding timeline. This means that on Earth-616, as the present moves forward into the future, the past is pulled along with it, causing events of significant magnitude to be dragged forward in time, including the intertwined events of the Marvel Age of Heroes. So, while Vance Astro originally unlocked his younger self's mutant powers around the year 1980, two years before the climate crisis of Earth-691, from the perspective of Earth-616, these events would have shifted forward in time by several decades. Because of this, Earth-616 was spared the devastating conflicts endured by Earth-691 around the turn of the century, such as the Bionics Wars of the 1990s and the War of the Worlds in 2001. This, of course, results in significant amounts of bureaucratic busywork for temporal agencies like the Time Variance Authority. On Earth-616, instead of becoming an astronaut, Vance Astrovic became a superhero named Marvel Boy and joined the New Warriors. He later changed his name to Justice and even became a member of the Avengers. Because of their different circumstances, the two Vance's powers also developed slightly differently. Whereas the future Vance Astro specializes in projecting psychokinetic blasts, the younger Astrovic has telekinesis. Sometime after returning to their own century, the Guardians delved into the time stream once again to prevent Korvac's reincarnation. First, they traveled to the heroic age of Earth-616, where they joined forces with the Fantastic Four. They went to Earth-8710 in the year 2591, the home dimension of Dargo Kator. And they crossed over into the 26th century of their own timeline, where they encountered the Silver Surfer shortly after he became the Protector of the Universe. 
Finally, back in their own time, the reincarnation of Korvac was thwarted with help from the Sorcerer Supreme, Kruger, and his mentor, the Ancient One, formerly known as Doctor Strange. For the full story of what happens next, you can jump into the 1990s Guardians of the Galaxy ongoing series from here. In that series, the Guardians battled members of the Stark, including the sinister Taserface. During one such encounter, Alita and Stakar were separated into two individual beings. Their ship, the Freedom's Lady, was also destroyed during a battle with the Stark, but the Guardians then commandeered one of the Stark's own spacecraft, naming it the Captain America II. During these battles, the Guardians were aided by the cosmic hero Fire Lord, who accepted an honorary membership into their group. The Guardians also embarked on a quest to find the long-lost shield of Captain America, which put them into conflict with the mercenary group Force, one member of which was a female Centaurian named Photon, proving that Yondu was not quite the last of his kind. Ultimately, the Guardians were victorious, and Vance Astro claimed the shield of Captain America. Meanwhile, freed from her former husband, Alita began to pursue a romance with Vance. The Guardians then met and befriended the living computer Mainframe, formerly known as The Vision. At some point after the War of the Worlds, The Vision had abandoned his physical body, joining with the computerized world Klaatu to become Mainframe. With Mainframe's help, the Guardians of the Galaxy located Earth's lost mutant colony, Haven. However, by this time, the population of Haven was mostly human and under the tyrannical rule of Wolverine's descendant, Rancor. Joined by the latest host for the Cosmic Phoenix Force, a Haven native named Jiro, the Guardians helped free the planet from Rancor. They were also aided by a young Skrull named Replica, who briefly joined them. However, Replica left to serve Protégé, the god of her religion, the Universal Church of Truth. The Guardians also encountered the Spirit of Vengeance of the 31st century, a cosmic vigilante who opposed the brutal doctrine of the Universal Church. They also suffered losses when a weakening Starhawk reabsorbed Alita and was kicked off the team. The remaining Guardians returned to Earth, where they battled a group called the Punishers, a contingent of Badoon and their human agents who based their tactics on the 20th century vigilante Frank Castle. The Punishers were used as pawns by Doctor Doom, who had survived by obtaining Wolverine's adamantium skeleton and using it as the basis for a robot body to house his brain. The Guardians also reunited with Terran, the woman who helped free New York by bringing Captain America and the Thing forward in time. By this point, she had assembled a team of guerrilla fighters called the Commandeers. Noteworthy among them was a man called Hollywood, who was in fact the 20th century hero Wonder Man who had been in hiding for most of the past thousand years. Another who would join the Guardians and become a valuable ally was the novice in human mystic Talon. Centuries prior, the trickster god Loki had isolated and enslaved the Inhumans into a selective breeding program, but Talon escaped and studied under the Sorcerer Supreme Kruger. Speaking of which, thanks to Kruger, Vance Astro was finally able to remove his protective covering and let his skin touch the air. Putting together a new costume based on his idol, Vance Astro took the name Major Victory. The Guardians also joined forces with the Keeper, formerly the Silver Surfer, to save Yandu's home planet from Galactus. Yandu learned that a tribe of his people had survived and stayed behind to watch over them. Martinex rejoined Mainframe to put together a secondary team called the Galactic Guardians, which included Replica, Phoenix, the Spirit of Vengeance, Hollywood, and Fire Lord. The Guardians were at one point forced to contend with a Badoon warrior who had obtained the power of Captain Universe. Meanwhile, the status of Starhawk shifted until Alita claimed the role, separating herself from Stakar and rejoining the Guardians. Reducing her former husband to an infant, she sent him back in time so that he would replay the events of his life yet again. She then aided a time-traveling Doctor Strange in defeating the Badoon Captain Universe. 
Meanwhile, Rita Damara, a hero from the 20th century named Yellow Jacket, followed the Guardians back to the 31st century during one of their time travel expeditions and joined their ranks. When Doctor Doom was defeated and Earth was safe once again, Terran was made the new president of the Northeast Corridor and Major Victory presented her with Captain America's shield as a unifying symbol. Terran asked the Guardians to find the legendary Book of Kells, which they retrieved from Shamrock and Cthulhu. The Guardians subsequently joined forces with Woden, the son of Thor, and battled his uncle Loki. Eventually, Stakar returned, presumably after living his life again in an alternate timeline, but the Hawk God declared that there could only be one Starhawk. Ultimately, Stakar reassumed the role while Alita continued to exist as a separate being, free to pursue a relationship with Vance. However, around the same time, the super demon Mephisto removed the preservation spell that allowed Major Victory to exist outside of his containment suit. While he survived thanks to a new black suit provided by the Beyonder, he was trapped once again. Major Victory subsequently met the High Evolutionary, another prominent figure from the 20th century who'd survived into the 31st, and aided the last Martian, Ripjack, against the genocidal alien Bubonicus. Stakar discovered the truth of his parentage and reunited with his birth mother, Kismet. Together, they battled Era and opposed his manipulative schemes. Meanwhile, after Yellowjacket returned to her timeline, a group of Guardians traveled to the early 21st century of their own and ensured the existence of at least one version of their timeline where the Earth won the War of the Worlds. That's all the time I've got for this week, but for a more complete version of the stories we talked about today, the early appearances of the original Guardians of the Galaxy have been collected in trade paperbacks called Tomorrow's Avengers Volume 1 and 2. The subsequent Guardians of the Galaxy series from the 1990s is available digitally and on Marvel Unlimited, and if you want even more, you can see their more recent appearances in Guardians 3000 and Guardians of Infinity. Anyway, that's all I've got for this week, and if you enjoyed it, please leave a like, share the video, and subscribe for more Marvelous content. Be sure to leave a comment letting me know what Marvel hero or villain you want to hear about next, and as always, the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description below if you would like to read them for yourself, as well as links to other places you can find me, including my Patreon page, where for only a dollar a month you can get your name in these special thanks here. So until next time, true believers, Excelsior!